three different copies of PBS. And here I'm in a voucher screen. Um, let's go back and go into customers. All very familiar to everybody with our demo data for Elliott Enterprise. What I'm going to do is bring up a sample here in what we call our classical screen. And this classical screen looks like this. And here's your familiar Elliott Enterprise. So this is PBS running in the classical mode. And you'll see as we go through this that we have two modes of running. One is this classical mode, which looks essentially the same. Colors are different, but it's essentially the same as PBS. And the other one is a graphical mode. And over here, I've got a third version of PBS. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you the graphical mode. Now, this is exactly the same thing. This is Elliott Enterprise. Here's the, essentially the same data, same demo data that we have. But now we're looking at it in the graphical screen. So what we're looking at here is real world PBS with a one-to-one, -one, very familiar environment, very comfortable environment. And here, the transformation between the classical screen, as we call it, and the graphical screen. The first thing you see are the big buttons along the top. We, Of course, you see the stuff up the top here, which is these are the familiar new and edit. And they really duplicate the buttons. So I'm not going to spend much time on them, except when I talk about the dashboard functionality, which is under options. But basically, the, the file and view functions provide compatibility with previous versions. When you're in graphical mode, though, typically you're going to be using these big, big buttons that allow you to add a new customer, edit an existing one, save your changes, save your changes and create a new blank form for entering, delete, and so on and so forth. Down below, we have a lookup here. And these, these lookups are rather nice and intelligent. First of all, the lookups uh, um, are responsive so that as you scroll through the lookups, you notice the data down below is actually changing. As I scroll down and up, you can see the data is going here. Not only that, it actually the, the format of the data has been changed from screen one, screen two, screen three, which was in the classical approach, to multiple tabs. So here we have basically name and address information. We have sales setup information, including terms, codes, and whether they're an open item or a balance forward. And it's essentially the same as what you would see on your real world screen as you go from here to here to here. So all of this information is essentially the same. But you notice coming back to our lookup that as we scroll through this stuff, we can see it. So the lookup is more than a lookup. It's actually a query device. Not only that, though, we can sort these in different ways. I can sort them as sending customer name and descending, or asking and descending in customer number. In addition, a rather nice feature here is when I'm, when I'm in, for instance, something like the customer name, in the old system, the upper lower case thing used to be a bugbear, which meant that typically people had the what to me is the ugly habit of typing all their names and addresses all in uppercase, all capitals. You notice all of this is mixed case. As long as I've got my, my cursor over this area, I can start typing S-U-L-L. -L, and lo and behold, Sullivan Graphics has been brought up. You can see it right behind there. Or I could be Space Concepts. Space Concepts. The thing is, you can see it jumps immediately to the right area, and it's case insensitive. I could just as easily have typed SPA all in caps, and it's fine with that as well. The data entry, when I'm actually doing editing, you can see that uh, I have full screen control. I can copy and paste, so uh, the standard Windows stuff, copy and put a paste in here. Um, I can do what I want with this sort of stuff. I can also update the fields in any sequence I want simply by clicking on them. So you've got random access to the fields through the, through the mouse, and you have the tab and the Enter key and the Shift, shift tab to go back, of course, all of which are Windows standards to move around the data. That means it can be very, very efficient to enter data because you can just enter the data fields. But as the Mattel commercials say, there's more. And that more has to do best shown in a transaction screen. So let me come back out here. The more is that we changed a little bit of the process, if you want, about the way we entered data. And 
instead of having you, uh, as you know, with the real world system, there are usually prompts at the bottom of the screen, F1, F2 to take this default, or, or shift F1 to do this, or hit F5 to do this. And that's done on a field-by-field -field basis. What we've done here is at every stage in the entry, we fill in whatever defaults we can with the data that you've just entered. So by default, I mean miscellaneous charges in accounts receivable. As our first guess, we filled in the credit memo, because most of the time, the reason you're in miscellaneous charges is that it's a credit memo. But you, once, once we start to, to create this, you'll see we'll be able to change this. First thing I know I want to do, though, is I want to select a customer. So I'm going to select Aerial Enterprises. Now, merely, merely having selected the customer, I now have where they are, who the sales rep is, their default terms, and I filled all of that stuff in. So I'm not hitting function keys to pick up the defaults. Those are The defaults are still there, but I simply have to override them if I want to make a change. At this point, I can put a document number, um, whatever, and I can also change my credit memo to a debit memo or do whatever I want and put in the date. Now, in addition, it's defaulting to today's date as soon as I enter it, but I have another little look up here that gives me a nice little date function. And this turns out to be surprisingly useful because what happens here is you can actually graphically see the day of the week. So uh, what I want to do is the document here, um, I want it to be for next Monday. Okay, well, what's that date? So if as long as I know today's date, then I can click on that and I know that I've not um, that I'm uh, got got my right date. You notice that when I selected that date, uh, I got a, a message that it was out of period. That's another new feature. I won't be dwelling on it, but throughout the package, we've added controls so that each month you change the boundary dates for what you're entering, and so the program can tell you if you accidentally type the wrong date. What I've got here now is for editing this one order. Under here, I have options, and the options allow me to look out at inventory history, items, serial history, work order history. All of these things are available to me without leaving the order. Similarly, if I want to check on the customer, customer number 100, what other open items do they have? What have I sold them in the past? I can pop out there and get the customer's history simply by clicking that button. When I'm done, I can come back. All of this is a general feature. I'm using a specific application to try and demonstrate it, but it's a general feature throughout the system. The last thing I'll be uh, dealing with, with is, is the interfaces, and um, I'm just going to give you one very quick example, but I'll be elaborating on these as, as we go through. Um, in here, let's just say we come down to um, the control function, and let's just print off a chart of account, valid GL accounts, first to last. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this as a PDF. Now, this, this is an interface. What we're doing here is we're actually calling other Windows programs to actually create the PDF. So we don't print this to a printer. What we do is we simply send it out to a program, and that program is now displaying this. And we can see here's our PDF of our application. Now, there's some major things. We do this, by the way, for PDFs and for HTML, both of which are standard universal file types. So the first thing about this is if we print this as a PDF, we can take this file, which is stored up here, and just drag it into an email. So it might be a vendor purchase report, and we want to report to the vendor. Or we want to report to the bank certain sales. We can just run the sales, send it off as a create, create a PDF file, and then put that into an email and send it off to them. Just as good, in possibly more, more useful for internal kind of communications where it's kind of unvarnished data as opposed to external communications, but still very, very useful for being able to take the data. And you have your choice of whether it's HTML, which is shown through a browser, or PDF, which is shown through the familiar Acrobat reader and equivalent. And you see we've got this function, and it's up here in as a PDF file. But the other major thing about it is that we have a search function that's built in. And for that, I'm just going to close the PDF and rerun this, first to last again. This time I'm going to salute, uh, check create HTML. So I'm creating the other file. I'm going to save it on my desktop, which is valid GL. 
Facebook.html. It's going to open it up for me. And again, we have a similar format. It's being displayed. But both of these have the capability of searching. Now, imagine month end, 300-page sales report or a 300-page GL detailed listing, and there's something you want to find. Well, first of all, summary totals are at the bottom. So all I do is drag down. I'm now at the end. No page down, page down, page down, page down. You're simply at the end. You see, you see whatever the summary totals are. But let's say um, I see here there's an 8,500 for my account number. Let's say I don't know where it is in the 300 pages of my sales report, but I have a customer account called 8,500 or something like that. I can simply do, click Control F and do a find and type in 8500. Bang, I'm right there, and it's highlighted all the other 8,500s. This is a tremendous advantage. What it means is you're probably going to produce less paper, you're probably going to be able to find the data on the reports that you're running faster. And you can throw them away when you're done. You saw how fast this was. This was not a major report. I ran it to HTML. I looked at it. I searched. I found the thing I want. So we actually have blurred the distinction between queries and reports because I can use this as a query and then just throw it away and ignore it. The ability to produce PDF invoices. I'll be talking about that a little bit in a second, a little bit more. But having produced PDF invoices, PDF statements, PDF purchase orders, we're actually organizing them. And we have a new section in the control file, which is like the print reports from disk function that's familiar to you from, from real world. But here, what we're looking at is the ability to have all of these guys listed out as with the print reports to disk. But in this case, because of the way we've coded this up, we actually have the customer and the invoice number. Or if it's a vendor with a purchase order, you'll see the vendor name and the purchase order number and the creation date. All of that comes with the data. But in addition, if I come down to, for, for example, an invoice, I can simply select the invoice and I can view it. And bang, I can now see I've got, I've stored this invoice out there. This is all part of PDF. Since I can use PDFs for printing, I can include graphical backgrounds, as we'll be talking about. I can include the graphical backgrounds. I can save the invoice as an image. And here we have that image, and we can bring it up and actually see it. If I select that same thing, and I'm not going to do it, I can actually select to email this function, which means I can actually send out that PDF attached to an email as an invoice. We've added a whole new infrastructure that connects the sub-ledgers with the general ledger. So what, what we have here is, just so that you're familiar with it, by the way, those of you who want are familiar, this would be vendor number 100, and I can scroll through invoices. This is the familiar screen here. When we transform it to graphical, what we end up with is something that's a little bit more comprehensive. We can have the you can see all of the invoices here and scroll through them and see the details here right off the bat. It's a bit more efficient. But what I want to show you in particular is that we've added a, a new feature. You notice here if I'm on this particular invoice, which was produced prior to version 12, the history came forward from a previous version. You notice this button is gray. As soon as I moved forward and I started posting invoices in version 12, those invoices got a special tag, which allowed me to view their distribution history. So here's an invoice that's been paid. You can see the invoice and the ACH check. We'll be talking about electronic funds transfer in a second. But you can see that it was produced. Uh, it was paid through ACH. It's an invoice. We can therefore see, we can just click on this button, and we can see all of the distributions for that transaction. And we can see that we had a $240 invoice, which we distributed to two 5,000 series accounts. There's our accounts payable account, the minus 240. So that's our uh, debit and debit, and there's our credit to AP. And then you can see we actually paid it so that uh, we actually debited the accounts payable account here. We credited our cash account, 1001, and we took a discount of 480, which then goes into the 5,000 and account. And there's our $205. So we're actually looking at the distribution. But the neat thing about this, with this navigator function, and this is the new infrastructure, the new feature that we've implemented right now in AP, but coming for the other applications, 
is the fact that it keeps track of the subledger to the general ledger so that when I highlight this guy, as long as this particular item is active, that is, it's non-gray, it's black, I can click on that. And now I'm back into AP and looking at the AP history. I actually see the transaction. I actually see the vendor voucher that produced that general ledger transaction. In addition, I wonder, well, $205, what, what else was in there? This is a typical kind of issue when you're looking at the general ledger, you're wondering what's happened with things. I can click on this, view related distributions, and now that's done a mini source cross-reference listing for me, and it now shows all the transactions that make up that transaction set. So I can see that although uh, I, I distributed <clears throat> Let me just pull this down a little. I distributed two hundred and five dollars to fifty fifty ten one hundred. I distributed another thirty five dollars to fifty ten two hundred. Total value two hundred and forty dollars. Therefore I did AP of minus two forty, et cetera, et cetera. So I see that all in one one immediate grasp. I, uh, it's right there in front of me. Major new feature called Navigator. 